So let's talk about IR spectroscopy here. So the IR is going to refer to infrared. That's the part of the electromagnetic spectrum we're going to look at. And when we use the word spectroscopy, we mean part of the electromagnetic spectrum, kind of light uh, a little bit. So, uh, but not just visible light, any part of that electromagnetic spectrum here. So we'll talk about a couple different types of spectroscopy. Uh, you'll see in, later in this chapter when we talk about spectrometry, though, we don't use the word spectroscopy because spectrometry isn't using light, electromagnetic radiation. Um, so big thing here is first off that infrared spectroscopy allows for the identification of functional groups uh, in a molecule. So that's the big thing we learn. Most of the, most of the time we're not going to get an entire structure of a molecule from the infrared spectrum, but we'll figure out what functional groups are a part of that molecule. Uh, in this case, it turns out infrared radiation causes vibrational transitions. We call these transitions either stretches or bends. And the two types of bends you should be familiar with are scissoring and twisting. And when I say familiar with, you should just know the names. Uh, it makes a great multiple choice question. It says, which of the following are common uh, vibrational transitions in infrared spectroscopy? And you should understand stretches, bends, and then the two specific types of bends, scissoring and twisting. Uh, but we're going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the stretches and almost none talking about the bends. Uh, the way this works, uh, when you've got a bond, the bond, the atoms are actually vibrating a little bit back and forth, and there's different vibrational modes we talk about. So, and when you go from one mode, like a lower vibrational mode, to a higher one, as depicted here, uh, turns out these modes are quantized. They only exist as certain quantities of energy. So, and therefore the absorption of energy is going to be of only certain values. Uh, in this case, we'll talk about frequencies most commonly, as we'll see in a little bit. But this energy difference, the light you absorb, corresponds exactly to that energy difference between the levels here. So it turns out that every bond has a characteristic energy, frequency, and wavelength uh, at which it will absorb in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, in this case, specifically in the infrared spectrum. Uh, we're going to measure these frequencies in kind of a new unit called wave numbers here. And if you notice, that actually is the inverse centimeter. So you can arrive at those wave numbers if you take a look at the light that's being absorbed and just take one over its wavelength as measured in centimeters, one way to come up with it. Uh, here's a typical spectrum right here, and you notice the x-axis here is the wave numbers. You'll notice one peculiar thing here is that it's increasing going to the left. And so it turns out that both energy and frequency are increasing to the left, wavelength to be increasing to the right, but we're going to definitely look at this in terms of typically energy and frequency increasing to the left. So if we look at the infrared spectrum and see which specific frequencies are being absorbed, this will indicate which bonds are present in the molecule. So for example, this guy right here is the indication that we have an OH bond. So in knowing that we have an OH bond, it turns out this one is peculiar and to an alcohol OH. And so the bond also gives us which functional group is present as well. So we'll identify some of the rest of these later on, but just an example of how we can identify the presence of certain bonds based on the frequencies of uh, infrared light being absorbed, and then also identify functional groups that correspond to those bonds. Now it is important to note that not all bonds are going to be visible in an IR spectrum. So it turns out that when you stretch a bond, it must change the overall dipole moment of that molecule. Uh, if it does, light will indeed be absorbed in causing a vibrational transition, that stretch. Uh, but if the dipole moment isn't changed, it turns out no light gets absorbed whatsoever. Uh, it turns out also with regard to that, that bonds with greater polarity tend to have stronger absorptions as well. Uh, if you remember dipole moment here, mu is equal to delta times d here. Delta is the partial charge of separation between, uh, uh, across the molecule in this case, and d is that distance of separation. And so it's d that we're really going to affect when we stretch a bond. So if we stretch a bond, we're going to increase that d value, which again typically would change the dipole moment. Uh, if we look, there are a couple of prime examples of what we call IR inactive bonds. So in this case, first one is in what we call an internal alkyne. So that's perfectly symmetrical here. So it turns out this bond is completely nonpolar. If you look at the delta, it has got a delta of zero. And so when we stretch that bond, it's still going to have a delta of zero. Uh, and therefore, zero times no matter what distance you stretch it apart, is still going to give you a zero dipole moment. So before you stretch this bond, it's got a dipole moment of zero. After you stretch this bond, it's got a dipole moment of zero. Since it didn't change, that uh, is going to be an IR inactive bond. No infrared light is going to be absorbed whatsoever. We'll see the same thing here on this simple transalkene that's also symmetrical here. So, and again, the key is it's trans here, and again, no dipole moment associated with this molecule. So, and if we stretch that carbon carbon double bond, it'll still have no overall dipole moment, and so no light will get absorbed. Now, we should compare and contrast this 
with the corresponding cis alkene. So it turns out this one's got a small dipole moment. And if you stretch this bond, pull it you know, to the left and the right, that carbon-carbon double bond, it will change that dipole moment just a little bit. And this bond actually would be IR active. It is going to show up. It is going to be visible in an IR spectrum. So makes a great multiple choice question, though. You might get a question that just says, which of the following are IR inactive bonds? And the two on the left here that I've indicated are the two most common to show up in just such a question. So it turns out when you're examining the stretching frequencies, two things are important. So in the first is the weight of the atoms. And it turns out for lighter atoms, you get higher stretching frequencies. So, but the second thing is just how strong the bond is. So, and you get higher stretch, stretching frequencies for stronger bonds. So notice that a triple bond is gonna have a higher stretching frequency than a corresponding double bond, than a corresponding single bond, so on and so forth. But it turns out the lighter atoms, that's the most important part, as we'll see here. So if you look at here, again, keep in mind that we have increasing energy going to the left. And notice that all your bonds to hydrogen have the highest stretching frequencies. And it's not because they're necessarily the strongest bonds, because they're just single bonds, but it is because they have the smallest or lightest atoms in this case. So that has a significant impact on the stretching frequency. So again, the lighter the atoms, the higher the stretching frequency. So you'll also see, though, uh, that for the rest of it, you know, carbon, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, some of the ones we'll look at. Uh, in this case, CX over on the far right, that's carbon to a halogen. Um, but ignoring the carbon halogen for a minute, so if we look at carbon, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, single bonds, versus then double bonds, versus then triple bonds. Notice increasing energy as you go from right to left there. Uh, a couple other delineations you want to look at here. And so one is we identify this right-hand region here uh, to the right of that dotted line at 1500 as what we call the fingerprint region. And we're largely not going to use it. It's not that it's not useful. It's just not useful uh, if you're in an undergraduate organic chemistry class. So much of what's in the fingerprint region involves like carbon-carbon single bonds, uh, which really doesn't help us distinguish between many of the functional groups much of the time. Um, so it is a really useful uh, region of the spectrum if you're an infrared spectroscopist, uh, which I am not, and hopefully you are not as well. Uh, but the idea is that they call it the fingerprint region, is that if this part of the spectrum matches your compound, so and some compound in a database, let's say, then they're the same compound. Um, just as if your fingerprint, if it matched the fingerprint on file in a database, means that it's your fingerprint, you're the same person. Uh, same kind of thing, that's why they call it the fingerprint region. One other thing to note, and I just want to mention this really in passing, so is that over in this fingerprint region, one of the useful things uh, you can do with it is you can tell the difference between like mono substituted alkenes and cis and trans and geminal substituted alkenes and tri substituted alkenes, all the different alkene substitution patterns. They can be distinguished from IR. You're probably not likely to do it in your class, but you probably are responsible for knowing that it is possible. So it turns out there's bends over in this region, and that's about the last time we'll probably talk about bends for infrared spectroscopy. Um, much of the rest of the time, again, we'll just talk about the stretches and especially outside that fingerprint region. So here I've included a table of some of the common absorptions uh, you're going to need to use throughout this course. Notice that you're going to need to use, not you're going to need to know. Um, you may need to know these. It really depends on your professor. So many a professor requires their students to memorize all of these lovely common absorptions uh, and kind of what those peaks look like and stuff like that, whereas many a professor will just give you a table of these for the exam. That way you don't have to memorize them. It's really up to your professor, and you should ask your professor which it is uh, in your case. Uh, but back in the day, we had to memorize these. It was really good times, and I didn't really do a great job of that first time around, truth be told. Um, but three of these I want to really look at in particular for a second are the sp3, sp2, and spch bonds. So if you look at kind of off to the right here, these common sp3, sp2, and spch bonds. So in an alkane, so this bond indicated in red would be due to the overlap of an sp3 hybrid orbital with the s orbital of hydrogen. So here in this molecule with the sp2, hybrid orbital of carbon with the s orbital of hydrogen, and here with the sp hybrid orbital with the s orbital of hydrogen. And the idea is that the sp hybrid orbital is 50% s. So it's made from one s and one p orbital, so it's 50% s character, we say. So the, whereas the sp2 is only 33 or one third s character, so 33%. And then finally, the sp3 made from an s and three p orbitals is 25% percent s character. Now, technically, we could have looked at the p character, but for whatever reason, uh, historically, we simply usually look at the s character. Uh, so the s orbital is lower in energy, and an electron in an s orbital is generally closer to the nucleus than a p orbital. So, and therefore, with greater s character, 
that particular orbital is going to have a, uh, a lower average radius and it's going to form shorter bonds. Shorter bonds are stronger bonds. And therefore, your SPCH bond is a shorter, stronger bond than your SP2CH bond, which is shorter and stronger than your SP3CH bond. So, and that explains the differences here. So, that's why your SPCH bond shows up somewhere right around 3300. So, whereas your SP2CH bond is showing up just greater than 3000. Notice I marked that as just to the left of 3000 on your IR spectrum, whereas your SP3CH is just less than 3000. So 3000 makes a good mark of delineation here to distinguish between SP3 and SP2. Uh, but those SP3CH bonds are going to show up just under 3000. So, and it's common, you know, for molecules to have SP3CHs. These show up pretty ubiquitously. Uh, the SP2s are pretty common as well. The SP is not quite so common. You're only going to see those for a terminal all kind. Uh, so those really stick out when you actually see them. Uh, they're also easy to confuse, it turns out, with OH and NH bonds. Uh, being off over in this region as well, but we'll definitely see what the shape of those and kind of uh, what they typically look like, and you'll definitely be able to distinguish them by the time we're done here. So let's take a look at some compounds.